Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our guest today is George Selgin, director of the Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives at the Cato Institute. I want to start really basic as we often do on Free Thoughts by asking what is money? So money is uh, – economists call it a generally accepted medium of exchange and what that means is it's the stuff that we typically use to pay for things and to settle debts and uh, uh, also the stuff we typically accept in, in our uh, uh, receipts as uh, compensation for labor and things we sell. And does that mean it has to have dead world leaders on it and uh, and be issued with little tracking mechanisms in it and magnetic no, strips? And neither actually though those things uh, – features are common enough, uh, uh, the latter in recent times and the, the former since the early beginnings of money. But in fact, uh, money uh, doesn't have to be uh, – uh, have either, either of those features. Uh, in its most basic forms, money is consisted of things like uh, cowrie shells and uh, wampum beads and uh, tobacco leaves. And of course, these primitive forms of money don't have any electronic uh, doodads on them, or, nor do they represent leaders of specific governments. Uh, more sophisticated forms of money and more familiar ones, of course, uh, uh, often do have those features, but even there, they're not necessary. So you can have coins that have king's uh, portraits on them but coins uh, can be and have been minted privately and good ones too. One of the myths about money is the idea that it, you can't have a good money unless some sovereign power is behind it and monopolizing it. It's one of the aims of the center to, to encourage people to get uh, past that uh, common misconception. But how would you – when wampum or shells or something like that comes comes into being, did someone say, all right, everyone, we are all using wampum from now forward. Everyone is now using wampum for money. You have to accept wampum as payments or how could that ever happen without some sort of agreed upon method of exchange? Well, uh, actually, it, it can happen without people agreeing deliberately and it, uh, it's not that difficult to imagine how. Uh, you have uh, – first of all, uh, in any small society, you have certain goods that are already treated as uh, especially uh, desirable and widely uh, valued for ceremonial purposes or perhaps as, uh, as uh, jewelry or ornament of some other kind. And uh, you only have to think about the problem every one of us faces when trying to buy a gift for somebody when we, who we don't know well. We're thinking what's something that's widely uh, popular that everyone wouldn't mind having a little bit more of that sort of thing. And uh, the, the origins of money rest in people making various attempts to figure out the answer to that kind of question. And of course, the more people who come up with any particular answer, the better that answer becomes for everyone else. And so you, you tend naturally to have a convergence on one or a very small set of commodities that, uh, that come to earn this status as generally accepted exchange media. So it can be an entirely spontaneous pro process. That doesn't mean governments don't get involved and didn't get involved in very early times influencing the outcome of this process and trying to manipulate it uh, as often as not though and not in the public interest but in pursuit of their own narrow fiscal interests. Well, that ties into my question which is – so the fact that Trevor asked this question of like, well, how is it that we could have money without, without the state telling us what the money is? I mean the reason that you ask a question like that is because all of the money that we see around us is state issued money. It's it's dollars and pounds and whatever else. And so if if these things can arise organically, why don't we see that? Why do we see the states dominating it the way they do? Well, there's uh, there's two parts to a, a full answer to that question. One is that it's not really true that most money today is is issued by governments. It is true that most basic monetary units today have been defined by governments who have manipulated the meanings of those units 
uh, but uh, uh, even in the case of most of these units, at one time, governments didn't have much to do with them. The, the pound was a pound, tower pound weight of, of silver at one time in history. It was simply a unit of weight. But in any event, today, most of the media of exchange we use consists of a bank transferable bank deposits uh, and uh, that sort of thing. And a relatively small part of it is the stuff that the Fed provides directly in the United States. Uh, so, so we should recognize the role of private institutions in supplying money even today. As for why, though, basic monies like the U.S. dollar are monopolized by governments everywhere, uh, the answer to that is not, as most people tend to think, that uh, such monopolies were necessary to make for reliable and safe monies. In fact, most of the government-controlled monies in the world aren't particularly reliable or safe. The reason governments got involved was because of the clear fiscal advantages there were in monopolizing money because when a ruler monopolizes money, let's say that money begins as a certain amount of gold. Let's say that you have a gold unit. Uh, by monopolizing production of that unit, uh, the government then puts itself in the position to redefine what that unit is. So a unit that used to consist of, let's say, an ounce of gold, they can say, well, from now on, that same unit amount we declare will be made up of only half an ounce. And so, hey presto, debts incurred in the old unit can be settled with half as much precious metal as before. This ability to manipulate monetary units, which which is derived from first controlling production of the representatives of those units, monopolizing them, is an incredible fiscal device that, that governments can uh, abuse and have ev abused ever since they've uh, uh, resorted to it. And when did America first start pr producing money? Or was it, have we been doing it since the beginning? You mean the American the government? American government, yes. They have. Uh, it was a decision that uh, was actually a somewhat controversial one during the uh, uh, founding era whether uh, to, to, there was a decision to establish a U.S. mint after some considerable discussion of farming out the production of coins to uh, private mints. Uh, but it was uh, always understood even then that uh, – any coin production would be sanctioned by government authority and that the government would be ordering the coins even if – whether or not it made them uh, itself. Uh, in any event, they set up a U.S. mint which like uh, European government mints at the time was a monopoly. So we've never really had a free market coinage system in this country. We've had uh, – episodes of private coinage, important ones and revealing ones. For example, during the gold rush, uh, the years subsequent to the gold rush as well uh, in California, a private minting industry flourished because there was no federal mint on the West Coast as yet. People needed to do something with those gold nuggets and powder in order to make that stuff useful without having to send it to Philadelphia or Charlotte, uh, North Carolina to be coined. And uh, so this was an interesting exception to the rule of government monopoly. The quality of the coins produced by some of these private mints was better than what the federal mints actually put out. There were not so good private mints, but guess what? They, they went out of business, just, just like any other industry. Now, what about paper money though? Because so we're ta when you're using coins, some, people, some of our listeners may not know that you're, you're actually using a, a term of art a, a, in the sense of you're a coin that has some amount of – that's right. Precious these, metal, right? These coins were made up of what was then the the standard metal, either silver or gold, uh, that uh, re defined the monetary unit. But you're quite right to bring up paper. Now, paper's been part of our monetary system for a long time, but for uh, many, many decades, uh, the issuance of paper notes, paper currency, which consisted uh, then of real substitutes for these gold coins and, and silver coins in the sense that you could turn these paper substitutes in and get a definite amount of gold or silver in exchange. The, the responsibility for issuing such, such paper money fell on private banks. Uh, now, uh, for brief intervals uh, starting uh, at the beginning of the republic uh, and then again uh, in starting in uh, the 18-teens, uh, 
We had a federal bank that issued paper money. The first second bank in the United States did so and then its successor, the, the second bank in the United States. Uh, but otherwise, until the Civil War, paper money was issued by state chartered banks. And the, depending on state laws, of course, they, they, they ran the gamut from good – uh, to indifferent to very, very bad. So I'm uh, trying to picture the world here. Mm -hmm. I'm a merchant living in New Hampshire in 1821 Good. and and I'm getting banknotes and the, and the banknotes are representing – you can you could go and get coin for those from the bank. If you in bought, principle. In principle. But the bad ones would be the ones that maybe you couldn't. Right. So when you said good or bad, that would be the, the – that's, that's right. Well uh, – uh, that's right. You you would uh, – and this was a big problem in the United States. I should – I want to emphasize that we had a peculiar situation because in the United States, unlike most countries, banks were typically one office firms that did not have permission to establish branches, usually not even within their own state boundaries, but especially – beyond those state boundaries. So, so that would make their money less valuable because you'd have to absolutely. maybe go further to – you have to go to Providence if, in, in, That's if right. it's Rhode Island or if whatever. A, if a note uh, managed somehow to make its way far away from the bank that originally issued it with the currents of trade, then uh, it often, certainly uh, if it went far enough, wouldn't command its full face value at all because at very least somebody had to cover the cost of getting it back to where you – to the bank where you could exchange it for actual gold or silver coin. And then, of course, there was possible uncertainty about whether that bank would still be around and whether it was uh, solvent. Would, would banks take each other's notes? Subject to a discount to cover the costs I just mentioned unless – there was a clearinghouse that uh, that provided for the expedient redemption of the notes, overcoming the lack of branch bank facilities that otherwise posed this problem. So, for example, in the very period we're talking about in the 1820s, in New England, uh, a bank in Boston called the Suffolk Bank took the initiative of becoming a central clearinghouse for all of the New England banks, offering to receive all of their notes on deposit at face value. If each of these banks agreed to keep a settlement account with it from which it could redeem the notes because, of course, it didn't want to be out of pocket for notes and it might not be able to redeem. Well, that sounds interesting because that would, that would actually give the clearinghouse uh, the ability to watch over the solvency of the bank. It did indeed. And in fact, the Suffolk uh, could be very strict about its membership. If it thought a member was misbehaving, it could boot it out of the system. The interesting result of this though was twofold, uh, three actually. One, the uh, uh, New England currency uniquely uh, of all currency in all regions of the country established very early uh, uh, uniform value. So what the Suffolk system proved is you didn't have to have a, a, a monopoly of currency to have currency that commanded uniform value in a wide area even without – the ability of banks to set branches up, which normally would have solved the problem. The other thing, though, is it had meant it, it by making currency in New England uniform, it tremendously enhanced the demand both for the Suffolk Bank's currency and for that of the other state banks. So this demand is growing at, at the expense of demand for actual gold and silver, which could therefore be more economized on. And uh, uh, of course, the corollary to that was that people – Savings were being more effectively used to promote investment instead of having to be locked up in coin, and it was a big boon to to New England. At the same time, too, you could have come in with, say, a, a Spanish guinea or something, too, right? Or I mean, yeah, well, you could pieces but it would have, of eight, or they would have know. been treated, of course, as as foreign money is treated today. Uh, you would have had to uh, exchange it for U.S. money uh, at a bank, and you would have had to incur corresponding fees because uh, by that time, of course, the pieces of eight no longer wear current money in the United States, though at a time they were as current as anything else. But that time had, by the 1820s had passed. Um, on the – having money be some sort of commodity, whether we're talking about shells or gold or silver or whatever. Or tea. That's my favorite um, one. Right, the, the big block of tea. I'm wondering <laughs> – so obviously you said like one disadvantage of state-issued currency is that they can just – Debase the currency. They can they can inflate. They can mess with it in ways that are harmful. That's right. Um, but for the commodity, would it 
incentivize, say, poor behavior in the sense that let's say we're exchanging like shells, some particular kind of shell that's just – you know, has no – that's what we settle on. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't that potentially incentivize people to say unproductively just I'm going to grow lots of this type of animal that makes this shell and I'm going to put all sorts of resources into just growing lots of these shells that is A, like not terribly productive work and B, is going to inflate the currency anyway? Uh, no, actually because okay. the whole point of a commodity standard money is precisely that in equilibrium – the 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 commodity in the form of money uh, isn't isn't worth more than the commodity in 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 in, in other forms. So, the, the the value of your gold coins, if you just uh, figure out uh, the the value of the gold of which uh, they're comprised, is going to be essentially the same in equilibrium as the value of that much gold contained in gold bullion the, the or some price. jewelry. It's just the market price. So what happens is production continues uh, for gold uh, whether it – when it's money as it would otherwise up to the point where the, the price e equals marginal cost and that's that. At that point, it's no more worthwhile going into trying to mine gold than it is to go, in, go, in, go into any other productive enterprise. It's paper money that poses the real challenge because with paper money, of course, uh, if it's to be worth more than the actual paper it's made of, which of course uh, – You could wallpaper your yeah, house with it. Otherwise, you might as yeah. well wallpaper your house with it. So if paper monies are to be worth more than just their raw commodity value, you have to have some artificial – in that case, you have to have some artificial thing uh, means for limiting production. In fact, open competition in the production of inconvertible paper money, we're, there, there, there is no com compelling, convincing theory that that wouldn't have to end with hyperinflation. That is, with the paper actually – with the money actually being – becoming worth no more than the paper is made of. But with commodity money avoids that problem because in fact it, 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 it's not expected that it should be worth more than the underlying commodity is worth in other uses. Uh, let's take a, a step back to take a lay of the land here. So we have some situations where you would actually be trading coins that are the actual money, the actual standard, standard commodity, metal, money commodity. What, silver, whatever. And so you're actually trading those. And then you have other situations where banks would hold those – that money and you'd be trading paper notes that represent the, a, a, a return of some metal or something valuable. So that's commodity currency but not a coin, It's right? commodity-based currency. So we mustn't uh, – um, um, we must be careful not to uh, mystify the, the topic of bank, bank notes and bank currency too much. It just so happens that in the earlier days of banking, uh, circulating paper notes were the more common IOU form uh, that served as money. But they they fundamentally didn't differ very much from the checkable deposits uh, and demand deposits that we're used to using today. They were also – those are also bank IOUs that serve in place of basic money uh, in, in exchange. Uh, the, the advantage of, of banknotes is that they could uh, be passed from hand to hand among anonymous people uh, and that uh, was not the case especially back when with checks. People were reluctant to accept checks because you couldn't really be sure that you could trust the writer of the check to have that much money in his or her account. You also in that case, of course, had to trust the bank upon which the check was drawn. If you think about it, a bank note is just a little bit less untrustworthy because if the note is genuine, of course, then you're concerned with the bank being sound but not with the soundness as it were of the person who hands you the, the note from that. Well, let me make, make an analogy here. I write Aaron a check. Um, I use an actual paper check. I think I have a few of them in a drawer somewhere. And then, and then Aaron can sign that check over to someone else. I mean, some of these things are illegal, but you could have the system where my check goes to him with my name on it, saying I guarantee this. And then Aaron transfers that check, signs it over to someone else. And then four people removed from this, they're they're still relying on me to actually be backing up the deposit. That's right, basically. and the, and they know that your deposit may be all this time being run down. And the likelihood of the check being good is 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 
for all they know, has uh, long disappeared. This is why checks don't – people don't hold on to checks even today, of course. You cash a check because the sooner you cash it, the less risk you take. Circulating notes are actually a much more straightforward way of, 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 of using bank-created substitutes to make payments instead of using some underlying money, whether it's coins or fiat money from a central bank. Uh, I say this because the the widespread belief is that having banks issue circulating notes is just something intolerable, that that has to be something that governments uh, uh, monopolize. But the truth of the matter is that uh, for the most part, any argument you might hear about why it's impractical to have banks issue circulating currency would apply with even greater strength to the present accepted practice of banks uh, allowing people to write checks off of demand deposits or use debit cards. It's really they're, they're just an argument based on ignorance and prejudice. We've, we've talked about commodity currencies, so coins where there's some actual stuff sitting there that we find valuable and that's what we're exchanging, whether in reality or through these, these notes that are good for it. And then we've talked about this fiat currency of government just saying, here's the units we're going to use to exchange. Well, but I guess when did that come into play? Let's here? make let me allow me to tell how we get from one to the other, and then we can pursue the the, the questions that come from uh, uh, that transition. So, as I was saying, in the United States, to keep to that case, which is not typical in all respects, of course, but it interests, I'm sure, your listeners is more than most. Um, during the Civil War, the policy changed with the Federal Reserve essentially taking over the business of banking by uh, uh, prohibiting – well, they passed a 10 percent tax on state-issued uh, currency and that was prohibitive. So the state banks had to abandon it, the, oh, so, the well, providing how, currency. So they paid the tax? The, the, the banks paid the tax when they issued a currency note? Uh, worse than that, yeah. If they had uh, any amount of uh, a state bank's notes outstanding uh, at the time the tax was assessed, which was annually – they would owe 10 percent of that money to the federal government. So well, it, ki value. it killed the whole system. It killed state bank note issue. Now, this was done, I should mention, that went into effect in August 1866, by which time the, the, and, and, uh, uh, the federal government had also created in the course of the Civil War a new banking system consisting of a large number of federally chartered banks called national banks. So the, by this mechanism, Currency was nationalized, not monopolized, but nationalized, put in the hands of only federal institutions. Now, I don't have time to go into the details of that, but because these institutions were designed to help finance the Civil War, and this was a real motive for this change, they were required to back their notes with U.S. government securities. Well, the problem so, is – yeah. What is a U.S. government security? Oh, let's, just, let's just clarify. Treasury yeah. bills, bonds, okay. notes, but in those days, bonds. Okay. So um, uh, that uh, uh, whatever its merits as a device for raising money f to pay for the war proved to be a very unfortunate arrangement afterwards because the federal government was retiring its war debt, was running surpluses often in the 19th century after the war. And as it did so, of course, the, the supply of these bonds that were eligible to back national banknotes dwindled. And the next thing you know, you have an inadequate supply of currency and an inelastic supply, as they said uh, 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 in the day. And that was an important cause of occasional financial crises. The Fed, to make a very long story short, was set up as a way of making up for this inelasticity of the currency supply. You might that was ask. That 40 years later though. I mean, well, this, these problems, this, this continued to be a, a problem and a worsening problem for – the entire span of time from the 1870s until uh, after uh, until the Fed's establishment, uh, you might ask, why didn't they just deregulate the note issue of the national banks and maybe let the state banks issue notes again? I mean, the Civil War is over; you don't need revenue. Good question. Uh, you can ask me that if you want. But in any event, instead, what they ended up doing was creating the Fed. And the Fed wasn't anything magical at all at that time. The Fed was essentially a set of 12 banks that were exempted from the rules restricting the currency issue of the national banks so they could issue Federal Reserve notes on assets other than government bonds. 
No, that's it. That's the magic of the Fed. OK. So now what you've got – well, the Fed was designed eventually to totally – supplant the national bank. So now you've got a nationalized currency and a monopolized currency because the Fed is not really 12 banks. It's, it's, a, cart, it's a monopoly uh, 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 managed by uh, a central board. OK. So how did we get from there to fiat money? Well, once you have a monopoly, it goes back to kings and coinage and debasement. Once you put a monopolist in charge of the basic money, you – you set up a situation where the monopolist can redefine what the basic unit really consists of. So when the Fed takes over, the basic monetary unit is still a unit of gold. In fact, it, it, the Gold Standard Act was passed in just 1900, really securing the gold standard uh, and doing away once and for all with, with a silver counterpart that had existed uh, this until was the that time. the presidential debate, the McKinley, the hanging cross That's actually – no, that's before that. That's before that. That's, uh, the, uh, that, uh, that is uh, in the 1890s. Uh, anyway, the, uh, the Gold Standard Act of 1900 is sort of the culmination of the victory of the gold side. Anyway, now you have the Fed responsible – uniquely, ex uh, exclusively for s providing paper substitutes for the dollar. But at least in its original uh, conception, the Fed is absolutely supposed to protect the gold standard, not alter it. The, all of this changes. It changes uh, tentatively uh, in during World War I when the Treasury puts embargoes on gold. That's well, a wartime thing and it's not really dismantling the gold standard. But when the Great Depression comes, of course, we have a suspension of gold payments and ultimately uh, various redefinitions of the gold content of the dollar. But most importantly, Americans absolutely lose their right to convert Federal Reserve notes into gold. And so they, they really have no access to gold at all. And that remains the case um, more or less permanently, although it's legal to own gold again after – 1976, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not a question of uh, owning – of being able to cash Federal Reserve notes into, into monetary gold. So is that – would you say that's the moment – I think it was 71 when Nixon took it off the gold standard. Is that when it became a fiat currency? There's, it's hard to put a moment on it because you have, you have first the time when American citizens cannot get their gold for their paper. That's the 30s. Then you have a redefinition of the official value of the dollar, which is, of course, essentially bilking the foreigners who still at that point have a right to get gold by saying, OK, but now you get less for each dollar. Finally, of course, uh, there's a lot more to the story, but the the uh, shutting of the gold window in, in uh, 71 and that itself, which itself is the culmination of a number of steps taken to prevent people from getting gold uh, before then. Uh, results in the dollar's last connection to gold being severed. And at that point, of course, it's certainly fiat money. Whether it's sort of fiat money before then is an open question and, a, and, and probably just a matter of semantics. So now I think we can maybe loop back yeah, around yeah. to the, the yeah. now that we've other got, question. Now that we've got ourselves yeah. to fiat so, money. Yeah. So yes, we've now we've, we've got this state-issued fiat money, um, which is – only valuable, so to speak, because the state tells us it's – I'm going to correct you on that because it's a common misconception. Sure. Uh, if, if the state could tell us how valuable it, the, its money could be, the Fed would have uh, uh, a nice easy job of it. They could avoid inflation by just telling us, hey, value this stuff more. The, 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 the only thing that preserves the value of a fiat money is restraint on the part of the issuing authorities when it comes to how much of the stuff they, 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 they put out. They put out too much, it loses value. They put out too little, it can gain. Of course, the overarching tendency of fiat money suppliers is to put out too much, hence the continuing depreciation of, of, of all world currencies. And then they have to resort to uh, uh, silly little devices like pretending that 2 percent inflation is really better than zero in order to convince us that they're doing a whopping good job of, 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 of protecting uh, their standard. OK. But so we, we contrast this – State-issued fiat currency. We've been contrasting it with this commodity currency, which again is that you know, it's money based in something real that we consider valuable and would be valuable even if it weren't being used for money. But that makes me think of if if those are the two things we've been talking about. There's this new thing around that gets a lot of talk right now, which is Bitcoin. 
And what is that? Because that's – there's – I mean there's no commodity there. That's right. Um, there's nothing – there's nothing valuable there. It's not state issued but it seems kind of fiat in the sense – you know, fiat I like yeah. that. So, so what – is that money? So Bitcoin is indeed strange uh, and uh, it's so strange that I wrote a paper a few years ago that's finally coming out uh, soon in the uh, Journal of Financial Stability. Uh, Classifying Bitcoin uh, 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 as uh, as a new kind of basic money, one we didn't realize existed <laughs> – could exist before. I call it synthetic commodity money. So uh, uh, I say this mainly to say <laughs> you're on to something <laughs> here because it, it, Bitcoin really isn't a fiat money in the standard sense and it's not a commodity money in the standard sense. It, we have to be very careful when we talk about commodity versus money versus Bitcoin and saying that the commodities have a use and Bitcoin doesn't. Of course, in some sense, anything that's valued by anyone for any reason must be useful. Uh, how Bitcoin first came to have value before it could be at all widely accepted and even today its, its acceptability is quite limited to, compared to other monies is a fascinating uh, question. Uh, uh, the best answer for which is that uh, people were playing with it and it was fun and they valued it for that reason. But the valuation is valuation. There's no such thing as a valuation that counts and valuation that doesn't count. So anyway, that's getting philosophical. But what does distinguish Bitcoin from other valued monies is it clearly doesn't have a, a, the usual sort of, uh, of commodity uh, uh, use value in that before this stuff was – uh, uh, used to trade with and speculate with and if you like play with, you couldn't do anything else with it. You couldn't eat it. You couldn't even in this case paper your walls with it. So it's quite unusual. On the other hand, uh, Bitcoin is not a fiat money in one important respect. It's not like fiat money in that it has a true inherent scarcity like gold, like silver. The protocol or software or whatever you want to call it that governs the supply of Bitcoin essentially guarantees that that supply will grow at a certain rate until there are about 21 million Bitcoin out there and that's that. There's no authority that can change its mind about that growth path or rate. There's no one who can manipulate it. You can start a new cryptocurrency, even the Bitcoin uh, founders themselves could do so, that grows at a different rate. But it will be a parallel uh, cryptocurrency. It won't be a new Bitcoin. It won't be a revised Bitcoin currency. And this is fascinating. And so I, I think it's fascinating uh, enough to warrant serious study. I, and that's why I wrote the paper I mentioned before because – Whatever you think of Bitcoin itself, this whole category of synthetic commodity money raises the tantalizing possibility that someone could come up with a synthetic commodity with a growth behavior that is predetermined in a sense nobody can muck with it but that it has very nice macroeconomic properties. We, we, we know that uh, the supply of gold can sometimes change unpredictably in principle. It could – cause a monetary standard based on gold to misbehave, uh, though I would take such a standard over a fiat standard any day if we could have one again. But, but with, with uh, Bitcoin and currencies like it, we have the prospect of, of designing the supply function, if you will, uh, so that any macroeconomist worth his salt would have to admit that this stuff is actually going to behave rather well. So you have the virtue of it not being something that can be abused and manipulated by authorities but it's also not something that can behave badly owing to the so-called blind forces in the marketplace. That's cool. It's, it seems like the story that we're telling here in this interesting way is about accountability of the money system. 
in a variety of ways that it could be accountable and the fiat system is the least accountable one because even the possibility of failure or having competitive banks with different you know with different reserves so they have an incentive not to overprint their thing is always just holding people accountable and you mentioned the the uh, gold shocks for example creating the system uh, or maybe undermining a gold standard in system. principle in principle i was thinking about um, one of my favorite economic essays the economic organization of a pow camp by bradford Brad, radford, radford. Um, and it describes how as a german pow a, a economic system originated and and cigarettes were the were the currency in this system as is often the case but you could have a shock to the system wherein they just suddenly dumped Red a million parcels. cigarettes, yes. right? Right? They just oh, here's a million cigarettes, and suddenly you were holding all these cigarettes, keeping you somewhat rich, and now now they just dumped a million cigarettes into the camp because there was extra left over after the war. That's you know, right. After they conquered the poles or something, whatever reason. That's a, a exogenous shock to the mm -hmm. system. So it's a way of thinking about how these commodity currencies themselves could be undermined. That's right. And then a competitive currency system. That's the accountability thing that I think is interesting. Uh, there's accountability there to to keep. Banks honest in a way that is not the case in fiat currency. That's the ultimate point. That's the libertarian point. Fiat currencies don't keep governments honest, right? They can manipulate them. They can do what they want with them. Absolutely, and, no, and with impunity. No central banker, as far as I know, has ever been punished for mismanaging a, a, a monetary standard or for allowing inflation. There's talk that there's a contract about, uh, according to which the president of the Bank of New Zealand faces certain sanctions if there's too much inflation and so on. But there's nothing to that contract. I've looked at it. Looked at it. It's so full of mights and coulds and perhaps wills that it has absolutely no teeth at all and they'll never do anything. Uh, so that's, that's pie in the sky. With, with, uh, with private banks, whatever faults people may attribute to them, the bottom line is a private banker can't uh, dishonors obligations with impunity. It's very simple. Every bank, uh, we know it's a very big deal if a private bank says to a depositor, we've decided we're not going to cash your deposit for the nominal value we said it was worth. We're going to give you less. You can't do that. You, you fail if you do that or you've got to get a bailout so you don't do it. But one way or the other, you can't just unilaterally you know, as a private banker, you can't do that. Central banks do it, you know, twenty times before breakfast, mm -hmm. and so I mean, for people to think that central banks are 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 where we should put our trust to have sound money is is, is absurd on the face of it, given the the incentives uh, at work. Uh, now, having said that, though, if you even the best private banking system can't make for a stable money if the underlying standard stuff. Right, whether it's gold or Bitcoin, cigarettes or tobacco, if or that crap. stuff is subject to shocks and misbehavior, then of course that's going to be reflected in the value of all these uh, uh, convertible substitutes based on it. Uh, now, people exaggerate dramatically the 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 extent to which. Uh, the more important uh, past commodity standards were in fact subject to su such shocks. The worst known, the most infamous gold supply shock ever was that following the discovery of the new world and all this gold and silver is flowing into Europe and you have something called the Great Price Revolution of the – approximately around the 16th century and well – Right, but if you look at the annual rate of inflation that the figures add up to, it's less than it's it's so low that it would have had uh, it would have uh, Janet Yellen today worrying that we're too dangerously too close low, yeah. to the zero lower bound. Seriously, I mean, it's nothing. It's less than a two percent target that we have now. So it's absurd to criticize the gold standard on the count of uh, on account of uh, it's having brought big uh, positive supply shocks. Um, but we could, in principle, with Bitcoin and some synthetic commodity money, we could we could design uh, something that would be guaranteed not to surprise us with such things, and that in that sense, it would be a big advance. I'm curious about this competitive banking because, I mean, so we all companies fail all the time, right? Like private companies go under all the time, or at the very least, seem to go under more often than governments do, and so doesn't that I mean wouldn't that make it potentially more dangerous to have a competitive system because I don't want I don't want my bank to fail and take all my money with it and so if I'm instead using the states 
you know, the state's fiat currency, I can at least think that the United States government is going to be around longer than this random startup. Well, you have to remember, though, that uh, by putting your trust in in the uh, central bank and issuer fiat currency, you you, you expose yourself to daily to a daily exaction in the form of the depreciation of the money that that institution is allowing, that you can do nothing about. Uh, now, uh, you have to compare that alternative with uh, the alternative of having a system where the government isn't involved at all, where your basic money itself doesn't depreciate the way fiat dollars do. And then, of course, where you, if you're using bank substitutes, how will those substitutes in that sound money compare to holding uh, fiat money of a central bank? Now, of course, the question of bank failures is very relevant here. But if you look at the history of banking and of bank failures, it's overwhelmingly clear that uh, the reason why we have major banking crises in the United States is because of the way we regulate banks. We have, we have misregulated them from the very get-go. I mentioned how we didn't have any branches of banks and that remained the case for the most part right up to, until the reforms finally were implemented in the 1990s with regional compacts made some exceptions but still. Now look, you don't have to be a finance expert to know that such a fragmented banking system is going to involve much less diversification and many more failures, other things equal, than, than a, a well-diversified branch banking system. In like, a short form, if you have one bank and it's in a corn-growing economy – If corn goes it, bad, it, the, bank the bank fails done. and so do all the other banks in the region. Look, in the Great Depression, Five, six thousand U.S. banks failed and just in the first few years and the number depends of course on the exact dates you choose but anyway, Canada had a nationwide branch banking system and during the Great Depression which hit Canada very hard in other respects, after all they were our major trading partner, zero banks failed. Now there's a fact. That's a fact. In uh, the United States, one state alone really had much of a branch banking system by the 1930s. That was California thanks to uh, the Bank of America, which is different from the modern bank. But uh, in any event, uh, California was one of the few states where no banks failed. These, these are over, overwhelming facts. But it's not just branch banking. Governments through their interference with banking have made uh, banks much more failure prone in a million ways. Now, uh, the other thing they've done, of course, lately is to uh, define certain banks as being too big to fail. And there again, what is the ultimate outcome of this? The ultimate outcome is that these banks are inclined to take much bigger risks that do ultimately cause them to jeopardize their own solvency, but they do so expecting fully well and having their creditors expect fully well, and that's where the real discipline ought to come from, that they'll get bailed out. You can't have a system where the creditors of bankers, including regular depositors, uh, are sure that banks, their banks are going to get bailed out if they get find themselves in hot water where uh, market discipline does what it normally would do, which is to take money away from such risky banks and put it only into risk-free risk ones. If I may add one little anecdote to this to drive the point home, when I was teaching in the University of Hong Kong, uh, some expert <clears> – <throat> from the Bank of England came there and he was advising the Hong Kong to adopt a deposit insurance which it had not yet done. And uh, uh, now living in Hong Kong and not even for that long, it was perfectly apparent to me and to everybody else there that there were two kinds of banks in Hong Kong. There were the big international uh, banks, the British style banks as they were called like Standard uh, and Charters and Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation. Uh, as it was unknown. And, uh, and then there were a lot of so-called native banks. You know, the, the native banks were not very well diversified. They were hardly better than casinos in some cases. But that's all right. Some people liked casinos. They put their money there. They took the risk. If things went well, they did well. If not, they took a, a big uh, 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 loss when the banks failed. Now, if you imposed insurance on that system, what do you suppose would happen? Well, honkers and shankers and Standard Charter and the other big British banks would be effectively subsidizing these risky banks. And anybody with any brains would put their money in the riskier banks 
uh, as long as there's no actual risk. As long as it was covered. Now, now it depends on the scheme whether it's 100 percent coverage or not. But in principle, 100 percent coverage, which for example is what we have here, would have this effect of of causing everybody to go to the high risk banks. Do you get fewer failures? No, you get more failures. You get more risk. It's a uh, it's this sort of interference with the normal operations of banks, interfering with their own devices to minimize risk, like branching, interfering with market incentives to contain risk, like <laughs> if you fail if you if you make bad investments and your creditors take a hit. These things have undermined the stability and safety of of private banks, not. The, anything inherent to the business of banking. And I'm, if I may, I, I must say I am sick and tired of reading idiotic expert advice from people today and there's more of it than ever now saying, well, we just got to stop banks from lending other people's money. We should just have them have more – capital and not allow them to lend, have 100 percent reserves. These people know, who are saying this are utterly ignorant of the actual history of banking, of the history of bank failures, of the role that bank credit plays in sponsoring development, which is extremely important. Uh, they would have us living in caves again just because they don't understand that you can have a sound fractional reserve banking system if you only get the government out and thereby – uh, stop it from undermining the normal devices the bankers have to keep themselves uh, strong. It seems as though possibly the story here um, is about basically trying to socialize risk in some basic way. People, there are some people who say, you know, if you let people do their banking in a free banking system, they might. Invest in a bank that fails. So we're going to put a system that socializes that failure out, and then the failures become systemic and they become more costly at, at the end of the day, right? They, be, they become taxpayer-funded failures as opposed to being put on the people who made bad decisions by putting their money in a specific bank. So they've socialized their. You failures. could say that, but you make it sound a lot more benign, in fact, than it was. It really hasn't. That hasn't been the story. The story has been one all along of corporate welfare. And it's not about the, the depositors. In the 1930s, for example, after all those banks failed, and this was just the culmination of a long history of high failure rates among unit banks at that time and it would continue later on, people understood that the real problem with the US banking system was its unit banking structure. That if we could just overcome the industry opposition to branch banking, which came both from Wall Street, which benefited from the correspondence system that branch banking made necessary, and from Main Street, which worried about, ironically, Wall Street invading its turf. <laughs> uh, uh, but in any event, um, everybody understood that uh, the unit banking was a flop. And uh, of course, after this disaster of the banking crises of the 30s, no sane person want to put his money back in the unit banking system. I wouldn't. But uh, uh, so the obvious thing to do is have reform through branching, create a sound system, a safe market-based system like the Canadian system but with more entry. Canada had restricted entry and, and so it wasn't ideal. Uh, but the politics didn't allow it. FDR himself recognized that deposit insurance was a very poor substitute. What deposit insurance was was way to prop up this fragile, indeed broken unit banking system, keep it going with – but basically you know, <laughs> giving it this infusion of, of, of support from the few sound banks in the system that there were because there are always going to be some strong banks that will end up subsidizing the weak ones. And so this was about saving a corrupt, rotten banking industry. And uh, FDR, to his credit, recognized the inherent dangers of deposit insurance. He'd opposed it as government, governor of New York. He was reluctant to sign the bill, but he eventually signed it for want of anything else. So now that was a story in the 30s. What's the story now? It's not again about protecting small depositors. It's corporate welfare now for the biggest banks. The biggest banks are being protected uh, uh, with too big to fail. This idea that the poor depositor won't know where to put his money or her money has things entirely backwards, by the way. Uh, until fairly recently, anybody could go to a library and pick up a number of publications, that private ones, that ranked banks according to their safety. 
It was as easy as buying a copy of Consumer Reports to decide what stereo system you wanted. Why did these publications exist? Because until Too Big to Fail really uh, came into prominence in recent decades, uh, deposit insurance had only limited coverage, of course, and there were enough uh, business uh, uh, accounts out there that were very big where you really were taking risk if you dealt with the wrong bank, right? So those people had an incentive to make sure they put their money in safe banks because at that time they felt like they could lose it. Now, of course, they just go to the biggest bank in town and they know they're safe in, in the country and you know you're covered. And everyone probably goes that's to the right. biggest bank too. Yeah, that's, that's over with. But in those days – so the idea that, the, that, that there's no way consumers can pick good banks, safe banks, uh, that they just have to have – we have to have a safety net. We have to have too big to fail. We have to have the FDIC. That's just a bunch of bull. And and uh, it, it 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 of course uh, the truth rather is no one bothers to learn anything about which banks are safe or not in the system we have because they don't have any incentive to do it. That's why our system stinks. So the history you've described in this country of the the rise of fiat currency and deposit insurance and all this other stuff is a history of poor decision after poor decision. If, if we were going to fix that, if we had the power to just change things to the way that they ought to be, what would that look like? Would it be a return to gold? Would it be the embracing of this synthetic currencies like we've talked about? Something else? What would, what would money look like in the US and the right system? So uh, there are two ways of thinking of your question. One is how would our system have developed if they hadn't kept botching it up from the beginning? The other is how could it develop today if we stop botching it up and start to undo some of these uh, policies that have been uh, wrecking things? And, and of course, uh, the the answer to each of those questions is going to be, going to be very, very different. Uh, um, and the answer, I should say, to the first question also uh, depends fundamentally on what you imagine is happening in the rest of the world, right? So we can't really abstract from that. But suppose the United States was the whole world and there had been no tampering with banks and money by the government. I imagine that we could have had a system that in many respects uh, resembled the Canadian system of the day that I described or the Canadian system in its heyday around the 1870s, 80s when it was a notoriously uh, stable system except – Canada, as I mentioned, a very, very narrowly restricted entry into its banking system. It was a, essentially a closed system. Now, studies have shown that it was nonetheless competitive in the sense that you look at the structure of interest rates and spreads and all that and it seems like the banks were rivalrous enough for the most part. But still, uh, one could have done better. With freedom of entry, it's 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 very speculative to one to 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 ponder how many banks at such a a free entry system that allowed nationwide branch banking might have supported. I suppose it could have been only dozens, but perhaps it would have been a hundred. I don't know. It is highly unlikely that it would have been thousands. Um, so we would have had many fewer banks in any case. They would have mostly had very large branch networks. They would have been very diversified. Uh, and of course, if the uh, federal government had interfered with who could issue notes, uh, the larger ones anyway would have all issued notes. Not all of them. Note issuing uh, is something that requires a particularly good reputation. That is, <laughs> if, if monopoly privileges don't uh, 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 support it. So we'd have a handful perhaps of banks that would have been issuing notes or a few handfuls at that. You'd see a Bank of America note. You'd, you'd see a see Citigroup note. Citigroup and note. occasionally you'd see like Third Bank of Georgia and you'd, you'd occasionally, wonder, eh, perhaps. could I actually but, use this Third Bank of Georgia was, note? But notes that people had those second thoughts about would, would tend to be weeded out. Banks like that would either go out of business entirely or would certainly leave the currency business precisely because people would 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 favor the other currencies to theirs. So there would be a, a few dozen perhaps different brands, nothing difficult to deal with. Uh, Canada had a, a few dozen for many decades and, uh, uh, and, and bank failures would be relatively rare. The stock of currency could respond to fluctuations in 
the relative demand for it compared to deposits. We know from the Canadian experience how well the currency supply responded to demand. It was elastic but not inflationary. Supply had a nice pattern of spiking in the autumn when you needed more currency for crop moving, coming back in and after the harvest and then doing the same thing the next year. Uh, the underlying determinant, of course, of the total supply of money would be the underlying supply of the monetary standard, which again here the counterfactual history is complicated by the whole question of bimetallism. Would it have been silver or gold or what? Uh, and uh, the answer is very difficult because it really it depends on on what what the market values of the two metals did. Ultimately, we know that the relative uh, decline in the value of gold after the 1850s favored gold monometallism. So it's easiest to speculate in terms of that. And uh, indeed, uh, we know what would have happened with gold monometallism because that's what we did have effectively. And it was mild deflation. Uh, generally not ex exceeding the average rate of productivity growth very much and so not particularly harmful. That is, the deflation was, was more or less reflecting decline it, declining overall unit production costs. Wages, therefore, didn't have to deflate and even rose in money wages. And um, things were not bad. <laughs> so in that world, yeah. you would actually have the fact that my parents paid – uh, 70 cents a gallon for gas or maybe 12 cents in 1971 and, and it would still be – It would be lower. Or, or it would all probably lower. be lower. Yeah. No, no, you have to look at – if you look at the real – under this arrangement, if you look at what's happened to real unit prices as opposed to prices – you know, uh, not deflated, and then imagine the nominal price is actually doing that, right? So, um, it really, the story would have been one of uh, the actual U.S. economy, um, eighteen, let's say, eighteen seventy to nineteen oh seven, minus <laughs> minus all the financial crises, which means you have to not only get rid of the peaks and all the fluctuations, but you can assume a, a higher trend line because of the losses avoided along the way. I mean, we're getting into the area of real speculation, but but uh, I think that's uh, roughly what we would have seen if the government hadn't continually messed things up. So but what do we given, do now? Yeah, I mean, given our, our unfortunate inability to ah, change well, the past, <laughs> that's, what can that's we do why today? I said there are two different questions because now having botched up and ultimately destroyed the metallic standards of the past, it's no not easy to go back to them because uh, we come to the original point about the evolution of money. Um, <clears throat> once you establish a standard, it tends to be self-reinforcing uh, and it's hard to switch. How would we ever get back to uh, a different standard? How could we have a move to gold? Imagining it occurring spontaneously as some, some gold uh, uh, advocates uh, do uh, involves imagining at least some, some people being the first movers in the process that – uh, mean that have to uh, uh, incur all the costs associated with trying to trade with something that no one else is trading with. That's not easy to do. It's like having your own very own computer operating system or phone network where the, you're, you're the only on, person on it so far. If you can't get some people to move independently and unilaterally to be first uh, to, to start this ball rolling, then what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is we get the somehow we get the U.S. government to, to, to get on board this idea and make a concerted change. Well, the problem with that is uh, now we have the federal authorities who we're trusting to commit to a return to a gold standard, but their credibility has been shot. It's totally shot. If the Fed announced tomorrow that it was going to once again start redeeming Federal Reserve dollars in a fixed quantity of gold, there'd be a speculative attack on the Fed on uh, on uh, Saturday if, if it were open or on Monday if not. And that's all there is to it and that would be the end of that. I don't personally know how you get around this dilemma, right? The dilemma of a private return to gold requiring somebody to start the ball rolling – and incur the costs thereof versus having the government take the lead when its credibility is non-existent. Uh, maybe someone knows how we can do that, uh, but I don't. But at the very least, we should stop 
too big to fail and stop. Uh, that doesn't mean – yeah, there, yeah, that doesn't mean there's not a lot we can do to have a better monetary system and that it doesn't mean we can't get rid of the Fed as a discretionary manipulator of money. It means going back to a gold standard is really hard. I would like to therefore you know, focus on possibilities for maintaining the dollar standard but getting the Fed, that is this group of people who can play with it, out of the story. And uh, there we have to think first of all about uh, um, uh, reigning in the Fed, doing away with its discretionary powers. Uh, ultimately, I think we can contemplate reforms where we just freeze the stock of Federal Reserve dollars. But – uh, a frozen stock like that won't won't talk about an inelastic currency, right? It would be terribly inelastic unless our our the rest of our private financial institutions were were uh, capable of of supplementing uh, the private the uh, the uh, fixed stock of Federal Reserve money with substitutes and doing so in a in a in a manner that could accommodate changing needs. To do that, we have, first of all have to have sound private financial institutions, which means we have got to get rid of too big to fail. We've got to rein in deposit insurance. We've got to get rid of the safety net, which is the a number one problem in our financial system today. But of course, at the same time, we we have to encourage the kind of financial diversification and flexibility. That, that can make the banks strong in, in themselves and, and instead of having to rely on safety nets. Now, we, the, the good news is we have branch banking now. The problem is by the time we got branch banking, we were mucking up the system with these, these other interventions. So we have a, a, a banking structure that could conceivably be a sound structure, but now we've got to get rid of the guarantees that have undermined the soundness of that structure. That, that's a lot right there. We should allow banks, once they are standing on their own, capable of standing on their own feet. And by the way, some banks are capable and have been all along. There's a lot of loose talk about the whole industry being unsound. It's certainly false. It was false even in the depths of the crisis. In any event, uh, when we have sound banks, we need to let them issue all kinds of substitutes for Federal Reserve dollars so that people don't have to rely on the Fed. We need to break the Fed's monopoly. Uh, so th those are just some of the things on the agenda. What about cryptocurrencies? The best thing we can do with those is to let them flourish. The government shouldn't play – hasn't played any role in creating them. It has no positive role to play in, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, encouraging them. Uh, the the, 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 the hands-off policy of government towards these currencies except to the extent of, of making clear – uh, uh, its treatment of them for tax and other purposes, and, and of course, it, it, there are better ways for to do that and worse ways. But having having a, a, a set of rules is better than having no rules at all. But otherwise, the best thing the government can do with cryptocurrency is keep the heck out. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.